Four years go by in which they're, they're not speaking together much at church. They own property together. They had a farm together. They try cases together, but not after 1876. They see each other at church, but this great friendship has re is really on the rocks. But they're being civil, but it's... And then Black goes on vacation. He owed it to himself. He had never been to London. You've got to go to London. And he goes to London in the summer of 1880. And he just knows that U.S. Grant's going to be chosen again by those dirty Republicans. He's come back from his world tour. He still wants to get in four more years. Or they'll give it to Blaine or that worthless John Sherman in Ohio. But he gets a telegram that the Republicans on the 36th ballot could never decide who they wanted. Grant couldn't get it. Nobody could get it. They have chosen an unknown representative from Ohio named James Garfield, who's only 49 years old, on the 36th ballot. And Black is reading this in London. And uh, he's torn. Is he happy for his friend? Would he campaign for him? Oh, get real here. <laughs> no, he's not going to campaign for him. He's going to campaign for Hancock the Democrat. But he writes to Garfield on June 9, I suppose I ought to be glad for two reasons at least. In the first place, it opens the way by which my very dear friend will probably reach that great office which makes ambition virtue. You're probably going to be president. And secondly, I should rejoice because it saves the country from the calamity of Grant or Sherman. And then he writes a little more in the same letter. I'm sure that if elected, you will try your best to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before God. Where is that from? Micah 6, 8. So he, he takes a scripture and he throws it back in Garfield's face. You will do your best to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before God. But to a certain extent, you're bound to fail. For in our country, the leader of a party is like the head of a snake. It can only go as the tail impels it. And your tail will be a very perverse one, that Republican Party. Then the Philadelphia Times gets a hold of Black. And they said, we're a Republican paper. We're all for Garfield. And we know you're probably not happy. But we will print anything you send us. And he says, I have been his devoted friend for many years. And I am resolved that I never will believe that he does not deserve the affection I have bestowed upon him. If he would carry the principles which regulate his private life, and I know them well. He has slept in my home. I've slept in home. We've been friends. We've tried cases. We've been buddies for a long time. If he would carry the principles which regulate his private life into his public conduct, he would make the best chief magistrate we have ever had. Can you believe that? I mean, better than Washington or Lincoln or Jefferson or Madison? The greatest president? Yeah, Garfield could be if he would go by. Oh, but he's not done. You could tell he's not done. He's not going to sign off there and say to the Philadelphia Times, yeah, print that. He's got a little bit more to say. I do not know any really good man who has done and assisted in doing so many bad things in politics as General Garfield. Well, Garfield gets elected. He beats Hancock. And now he writes to Black on July 20. And he says, I know how grounded you are in the ways of political thinking, which seem to you just and for the highest good of your country. And so all the more for that reason, I prize your words of personal kindness, succeeding or failing as president. I shall nonetheless honor your noble character and your great intellect and your equally great heart. So the friendship is sort of coming back together. Garfield gives the address, the inaugural address. That's on March 4. But on July 2nd, after being president only four years, he is shot twice in the train station as he's leaving to go see, go on vacation, meet his wife in New Jersey, go up see his boys at Williams College. He's tr walking in hand in hand with his secretary of state, James Blaine. The man who shoots him is a disgruntled office seeker. He's, uh, he's not mentally all there. He's a, 
He's a um, French Canadian who's, you know, would never have been appointed to an American position. He wanted to be ambassador to France. He's not living in the real world. But he shoots Garfield twice. And um, they rush Garfield back to the White House. And uh, the word gets out to Black that his friend has been shot. Here's Gar one of the pictures of Garfield as president. If there ever been a movie on Garfield, I look at this picture and think years ago, Paul Newman could have played this role. This is a Paul Newman side view. He could have played Garfield. So I go back to, he shot, he comes in. Black comes over, they won't let him see Garfield. He's one of the first ones there. A week goes by, and a week later, Garfield comes out of his stupor. And we know this because Alman Rockwell tells this story. And we know it because Dr. Edson is standing there. She's the only woman doctor that's attending him. And Susan tells the story. And they tell it to Mary Black. And that's why, and this is right out of our Seaver College Library, this book was published in 1887, Reminiscences of Judge Black, by his daughter, Mary. And um, Garfield raises up in great pain and says, has there been any word? Has there been any word from Judge Black? And Alman Rockwell said, oh yes, Mr. President, he was the first one here. He wanted to see you. We didn't let him in. He's been back several times. He wrote a telegraph, a telegram. It's the most sympathetic we've received. And they said, Rockwell and Susan Ed Edson, the, the doctor there, they said that Garfield slumped back into his pillow and said, that almost pays for this. Translation, it's almost worth getting assassinated if I'm back in fellowship with my brother in Christ. It's sad that it took this, people killing each other, but that almost pays for this. So Garfield's term ends in 1881. They rushed him to the seaside thinking he might get better if he could look out at the ocean in New Jersey. And I drove a long time trying to find this marker. I thought, well, maybe there's not one there. But here it is, behind the house. James Garfield died on this site, September 19, 1881. He lingered 11 weeks. This man who was six feet tall, weighed 210 pounds, had an enormous voice, broad-shouldered, was, you know, had cut down forests in his teenage years. He died at 130 pounds, bony, skinny. Um, the White House was draped in black. I don't think they did that for Lincoln's assassination. I've never seen, a, I, this is a stunning photo that I just, I was just surfing the net and found this photo. The White House in mourning. The sermon was preached by Frederick Power, the minister of the Vermont Avenue Church. Jeremiah Sullivan Black was in the audience. I think he probably wept, but I can't prove that. The other big funeral was at Cleveland, Lakeview Cemetery. They built this for Garfield. He was the last president born in a log cabin. And they buried him in a, what is this, a temple. And the funeral was preached by Isaac Herrett, the editor of the Christian Standard, which we have every issue in our archives. Um, our Eret said, I always thought he would preach my funeral. We made an agreement years ago that whoever died first, the other would preach his funeral. And I just knew I would die first. And Garfield, the President of the United States, would come preach my funeral. How many showed up at Cleveland? The actual count was a little over 250,000 people. It was the largest funeral in American history. Over a quarter of a million people came to say goodbye to Garfield at Lakeview Cemetery. The lar largest funeral at that time. And what happened to the little shack, the Vermont Avenue? So much money came in from all over the country who wanted to build a nicer church building for Garfield's old church. And they built this one. So the old Campbellite sh shanty. By the way, look at those four windows in the Campbellite shanty. Go down to the second one from the end there on the right side. That's where Garfield always sat, and that's where Guteau was going to assassinate him. He stood outside that window one Sunday, and he measured where Garfield was sitting, and he didn't want to hit Garfield's wife, and he didn't, especially he didn't want to hit Garfield's mother. But he thought he could pull it off, 
And he came back the next Sunday, and that was the only Sunday in the four months that Garfield wasn't at Vermont Avenue Church. He was giving a speech in Baltimore, and he was worshiping with the Christian church in Baltimore. So Garfield was not sh shot in the church building, uh, which would be horrifying enough. And then they build this gorgeous building. And then uh, Black only survives two more years, and he's buried there in York. So here's where the canvas of our story has been. On the far right, York, Pennsylvania, the home of Black. On the far left, not on the far left, but below Pittsburgh, Bethany, where Campbell lived. And then up in Cleveland, up in the Cleveland area, where Campbell was born in, a, I mean, Garfield was born in a log cabin and went to Hiram College. Here's the speeches of Jeremiah Black. Here's the book, that was by his son. Here's the book his daughter put out. Chauncey Black said in the front of the book, I think it's unnecessary to inform the reader of these pages that Jeremiah Black was a devout Christian. And then the members of the church decided to build a college and name it for Garfield in Wichita, Kansas. It lasted four school years. And then they had a famine. All the farmers went broke. The building sat empty and was purchased by uh, the Quakers and named Fringe University, and it's still there today. It's in beautiful shape. You go up to the front. It says this building's on the National Register of Historic Places. It was once Garfield University, and today it's Fringe University. Norwood writes in his book, and I close with this, why these two men had remained such warm friends is, in some ways, an enigma. It's not happening today with the two sides. People who've been friends all their lives are not speaking to each other now. It's, you know, it's, but, but that's democracy. It's messy. It was messy when Ed Larson wrote that book on the very first campaign. And I'll tell you it was messy in 1866 when Jeremiah Sullivan Black was the lawyer for Tilden and Garfield was on the electoral commission that ended up giving all those votes to Rutherford B. Hayes. And so Briggins writes, they differed so violently in politics that it seems a sheer miracle that their friendship should have outlasted a single election. But it lived on. It lasted 20 years. And how did it end when Garfield lay dying and he heard that Jerry Black had been the first one at the White House and had come to see him and wrote the most sympathetic telegram Garfield sinks into what is really his deathbed and says, that almost pays for this. We have about five minutes, but you've been a great audience. I don't think I want to do Q&A. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed. <laughs>